Programmers have a lot of guidelines to determine what makes good code. The goal here is pretty simple. We want code to be performant, we want it to be readable, and we want it to be easy to upgrade. To achieve those three qualities, programmers have built a lot of principles for how to write code. And I would argue these principles make sense most of the time. But what happens if we sacrifice every principle for the sake of performance? When we say skill issue to anyone who can't understand the code, and when we don't mind turning our code into an absolute abomination that only works on a single architecture and is near impossible to debug. We'll start pretty simple and tame. Let's look at these two versions of the struct for a collision triangle for my Nintendo 64 game. The left side has a 2 byte padding that we should never access or write to. Without this padding, this struct would be 46 bytes in size. And with it, it's 48 bytes in size. 48 is a multiple of 16, which means it will be aligned to the lines in the data cache of our N64. Machines read your code one cache line at a time, so if your data doesn't align to the beginning or end of a cache line, you have to use more RAM accesses than necessary. If we were to remove this padding, there would be a chance that we need an extra cache line to read the collision triangle. And we would lose about 0.1 microseconds per triangle on average. One important principle when you write optimized code is to ensure that every assumption you can make is baked into your code and communicated to the compiler. Let me show you with this example of this approach function. It makes value approach target by up to increment units. This is Mario 64's version, made easy to read. The version I'm using is so incredibly cracked that I'll have to explain all the bit manipulation going on later in the video. What we care about here is something else. Take a look at the return value. By returning an S32 instead of an S16, we can prevent the compiler from compiling a cast to an S16, which takes two cycles and looks like this. The compiler automatically injects this piece of code anytime you implicitly cast an S32 variable to an S16 variable. But just returning an S32 instead of an S16 has an issue. It means that many pieces of code that call this function have to cast the output of it later on. And calling this function will compile into something like this now. But since we know that this function always approaches an S16 from an S16, we also know for a fact that the return value will be a valid S16 variable. That means we can just cast the function signature and call our spoofed version of this function to avoid the cast in both the function and the return value read. This saves two cycles every time we call it for no downsides at all. A much simpler opportunity to prevent casting is by avoiding overflow emulation. I can't think of a better term, but this term explains the phenomenon best. Let me show you what it means. Let's say we have an index for a globally used array and we need to increment it. Our array is small, so we'll store it in a U8 and don't worry about overflow here. Now look at this code. We increase our array index by 1 and store an element into this array. Looks fine. So what's inefficient about this? If we increase our U8 index, the code will compile a U8 cast to ensure it's still a valid U8 in the current register. This takes one extra cycle and we don't need or even want this. By making a local S32 copy of the variable and then storing the variable back into GMAT stack index, we can skip this cast for no cost at all, since it will compile a store byte instruction to save the variable back into memory, which casts and stores in just a single cycle. For my next trick, I'll need to go on a tangent about S data first. I'm using a special register called the GP register as a pointer into a small data segment. This is a fairly common practice and it helps you read data in one cycle less on the N64. So far, so good. We all know true is defined as 1, false is defined as 0, and null is defined as 0. Surely there's no better way to do this. Huh? Okay, what the fuck is this? We bound the value of true to a register instead of a value, and this register is GP. Since the memory address of our S data stays the same, the GP register will always be the same non-zero value. By using the GP register instead of the value 1, we can store true in just one cycle instead of two. There's one caveat here. Since GP 
is 16 bytes aligned, one in 16 compilations will end up aligning the GP register to a 256 byte boundary. And this will cause the GP register to have a value that looks like this. In which case, storing GP will just store zero into byte sized variables, because as I explained earlier, the store byte instruction casts and then stores, and your game will simply not work. Awesome. We messed up our code base so badly that now we've added randomness into whether the game compiles correctly or not. Wow! Incredible! This also means we need to remove all comparisons to true, because sometimes true will be truncated to the last two digits, as I explained before, and the last two digits are not gonna be equal to the whole thing. But this is fine, because comparing the true is garbage anyway. You should just check if it's non-zero. A different and much more sane and useful register usage is to find the most commonly used variable on your thread and to reserve a special register for it. I store a display list pointer on my graphics thread and the currently processed actor on my gameplay thread in a special register called FP that is reserved in the compiler. This alone reduced my code in size by 3%, which is pretty insane for such a simple hack. Of course, this is very machine dependent, and on machines that have less registers, this might not be worth it at all. In the same vein, we can also store hard-coded values. For example, I opted to store floating point value 1 into a register so we don't have to ever generate it at runtime. Here's a little puzzle. You have a variable, iteration count, and a pointer into a linked list called note. So how would we iterate this list? Iteration count times. Like this maybe? Seems pretty straightforward, right? Exactly, that's wrong. You can't trust compilers here. Most machines have a compare to zero instruction and modern GCC is not slotting it in here all the time. We have to rewrite our code to make this work. I don't know as much about other machines, but in the N64, this will save two cycles per iteration. But this is skipping i equals zero. I hear you say, and you're right, but it doesn't matter here. In situations where we actually use i to index into an array, we have to do some unfortunate stuff. Since using a constant in addressing doesn't cost anything on most machines, we can simply offset in the actual array indexing. This still saves two cycles per iteration, but it makes your code borderline undecipherable. Admittedly, this is something the compiler should take care of for us, but for some reason it doesn't. So we'll just have to live with it. But we have already decided to sacrifice readability in the intro, so this is a great trick. Speaking of sacrificing readability, we can use go-tos for branch prediction. So running this function will cache the entire function regardless of whether the condition passes or fails. This is bad. The same principle of data locality applies to code as well. We can flip this whole thing around with a go-to to force the compiler to put this part of the code first. This compiles to the same amount of instructions and costs the same amount of cycles, but it rearranges the memory so that this snippet comes first, allowing us to skip caching this part. Part. The worst part is that this is almost universally better whenever you have any code with a structure like this. And now my day is ruined because I don't want to have to write code like this all the time. Another memory optimization for your code that you can do is to repurpose functions in ways that are absolutely not intended. Take a look at lateral dist between objects. This function uses Pythagoras theorem to get the distance between two actors. Can you spot other users? We can use this for any vector we'd like actually, by passing a pointer to any vector and shifting its offset by the same amount that the position vector is offset from an actor's memory location, the code will work out to still compute the lateral distance to our vector. This might get you fired from your job, but it will save you caching another function on the CPU and it ends up making our rambles go vroom vroom, so I'd say it's worth it. Much less controversial and something that should probably be done a lot more is avoiding engine pollution. The more specific the functionality of your engine, the faster your engine will run. So what should we do if we have to add new features to our engine? I have this enemy here that makes the floor slippery if Mario is touching the puddle it creates. How is this done? The simple solution here would be to set a flag whenever Mario is overlapping this enemy and to read that flag to always make the floor slippery. But this sucks. We are now reading an extra RAM address every tick and we have a few extra cycles to evaluate the contents of this address which will cost us about 0.2 microseconds per tick. 
Instead, we can do some dirty stuff and edit the data that is supposed to be constant. We'll simply set the flag on any surface that Mario is on to include the very slippery flag and are able to implement this functionality without any extra code in engine. Now this is literally free of cost unless the specific enemy is interacting with Mario. And when manipulating the data is not possible to get the desired functionality, there is a dark side to avoiding engine pollution. Self-modifying code. Let's say we have a function that either returns two or three depending on whether some flag is set. The naive implementation looks like this. But instead of having an if condition, you can mem copy the modified behavior of an already existing function. In this example, this saves two cycles and a memory read. So about 0.2 microseconds on the N64. Using this trick, you can modify your engine code at runtime to have it act differently, which is especially useful if the condition rarely changes. Of course, you have to make sure that you only modify the code while it's not cached or mark it dirty in instruction cache and bring a bulletproof vest to work because your coworkers might just try to assassinate you. If you are going really hard on this, you can even use this for different versions of hardware. For example, the N64 has an early revision with bugs that require compilers to slot in some slower instructions to avoid a crash. With self-modifying code, I can detect the hardware version and only avoid the bug on early models. A lot of floating point math can be done much faster with integer bit manipulation. Look at this random float function from Mario 64. Obviously garbage, so let's look at what they probably meant to do. This will cost a random call, one into float conversion, a float generation and a division. So about 37 cycles on top of the random call. It's much easier to just slot the bits from the random call into the mantissa of float one, aka 0x3f80 and then four zeros, to generate a value up to 0x3ff and you know the rest, which is floating point 1.99 and so on. Then we just subtract 1 to get a value between 0 and 1. This costs 1 in generation, 1 left shift, 1 OR and 1 float subtraction on top of the random call. So 6 cycles. It is literally 6 times faster. The output of this is also almost the exact same, since if the exponent of a float stays the same, the values in the mantissa are evenly spaced out as well. We'll look into optimized subroutines the compiler inserts to boost our own code. We'll need to go back to approach S16 symmetric. Alright, what is all this stuff happening here in the optimized version? This is easiest to explain by looking at the apps i function first. This function returns the absolute value of an integer in 3 cycles. Let me explain why it works. Let's say we have a 16 bit register width and a value A. Right shifting a value by register width minus 1 will fill the register with the sign bit. We'll look at what happens for negative values first. If this value A is negative, this will fill the register with 1 bits since the sign bit is 1. If we XOR all the bits with this result, we end up flipping every single bit of our variable. Let's take a few example inputs. Minus 1 is FFFF becomes 0. Minus 32768, which is 0x8000, becomes 7FFF, which is 32767. Minus 16384, which is 0xc000, becomes 0x3FFF, which is 16383. You should see a pattern. We are off by exactly 1 on the absolute value, which is what this last line does. Since all ones is the value 0xFFFF, which is minus 1 in human readable language, we end up subtracting minus 1, the same thing as adding 1. So this works out just fine for negative values. For positive values, the first step would fill the register with zeros and then do absolutely nothing in the second and third step. That's perfect because the absolute value of a positive value is itself. This means that this function can return the absolute value of an integer in three cycles without any branches. Why am I telling you all of this? We can use the same trick right here in our code. By getting the bits of the distance between the current and target, like in step one of the appsi function, we can flip the sign of the increment by the sign of the distance. This lets us skip all these branches to figure out which direction we are moving 
and ends up saving a few cycles. By learning about some of the super efficient assembly subroutines that the compiler will insert, we can take advantage of the same ideas in new ways to squeeze out some performance. Good code has to be written in almost clear English for it to be easy to understand in our human logic, and compilers then turn this humanly readable code into computer logic. This is why I like to say that we program mostly in English, but sometimes in C. And this function is a pretty good example for coding in C more than in English. But we can go one step further. Sometimes programming in C is not good enough. The compiler is faulty and often doesn't compile the best code. As soon as you're doing inline assembly, you're talking about stuff that is only useful for your one specific architecture. We had to do some inline assembly to avoid the compiler from screwing itself over and wasting free pressure cycles on this function that runs thousands of times per tick. And even inline assembly alone was not enough. We had to separate the negation into a separate function and inline this one to prevent the compiler from screwing this up. I've worked on this code with Silas and he really tried to make this understandable with documentation, but I doubt any amount of documentation will make this function easy to follow. And just for the fun of it, I want to show you the pinnacle of sacrificing readability, atan 2 s this function gets the angle that two vectors point in. This is Mari 64's version and it can be improved to be about four times faster with a four times higher accuracy as well. This is what the code looked like without BS optimizations and it took 44 instructions. With all this BS, it's only 40 instructions, so it's about 10% smaller. Don't look too hard at it, all of the changes here are nonsense that force the compiler into compiling specific instructions. Obviously, ideally your compiler would take care of 90% of this by itself, but it is what it is. That's everything I could think of right now. If anyone linked you back to this video because they ruined your codebase with this stuff, you're welcome. I hope some of this will be useful for you, and I'll see you in the next video.